Have I got a show for you, Denise? Fantastic. Tell me all. What is it? Okay, so it's going to take me a while to explain. I'm a bit vague. About uh, 20 minutes? Oh. No, no. I, no, no, no. Come on. It's just like Fleabag. Oh, absolutely not. Oh, thank goodness today's running free session is about pitching, Esther. You clearly need it. <laughs> Huge excitement. You've been invited to pitch your idea to a commissioner or a funding body, the people with the power to make or break your idea. So what are the do's and don'ts? Now, Lee Namo from Screen Australia is our guest today, and he's going to help us pick through the best way to sell your wares. Hello, Lee. Hi, how are you going, Denise? Very well, thank you. How are you going in all this weird time? Yeah, doing well, doing well. Just, you know, trying to maintain as much business as usual as possible in uh, obviously not usual settings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're getting all sorts of peeks into people's houses by doing these. It's quite fascinating. <laughs> okay, let's just back back a bit because one of the things I find really interesting about your career was your part in that amazing comedic work, um, The Axis of Awesome. So let's talk about, did you ever have to pitch when you were part of that group? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We, um, you know, we had a few bigger pitch meetings, not too many, but, um, and actually I'm trying to think of any that, that were successful. I can think of some unsuccessful ones. Um, but yes, we pitched, we pitched for TV shows and funding from funding bodies, normally in kind of pitch video form is this kind of standard way, but um, yeah. So we did have some wins. That's, that's true. And so how did you feel as someone who was pitching ideas as opposed to being pitched to? Yeah, it's very nerve wracking. You feel like you definitely feel like, oh, this is it. This is the opportunity. If I blow this, if, if we don't get this across the line, then that's it. Might as well just, you know, go back to uni and get a teaching degree. Not that there's anything wrong with a teaching degree. Um, teachers are great and, and never more valued than they are now. <laughs> You're backing yourself out a big fat hole there, so I'll just <laughs> let you carry on doing that. Um, but, it, yeah. is, it is nerve wracking. It, it does feel like there's a lot of pressure. And I guess that's one of my tips I'll get to later on as well. It's like there are multiple opportunities that you will have across your career. This one opportunity to pitch is not the only thing, the only time. So I thought it'd be good, I mean, by way of a bit of background with me too, even though it was a few years ago, I was head of production and development at SBS and head of factual at the ABC in particular. So I've taken a lot of pictures. But as a producer, I've also done a lot of pitching. And as you say, it's incredibly nerve wracking, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you have any big wins or big ones where you go, oh, well, I learned some lessons there. Oh, look, that's a really good question. Yeah, I did. And what, like, one of the big wins that I had was pitching with John Clark to get the games up for ABC. And in brief, but, you know, that had sat for a couple of years at Channel 9. Um, and as a sort of conventional sitcom, and so John asked me to sort of help. And um, long story short, we did and we got it up. And it was amazing. And I was so excited. And I went back to my darling boss at Beyond at the time, Michael Borker, and I said, Yay, we just landed this. And he went, Yeah, great. Now, what else is on your slate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a come down. No, he was a he is a businessman, but yeah, no, it is it is tough. So let's talk about what do you like or what do you dislike? I think let's start about that in pitching um, approaches. Sure, I guess one thing that I find is common that it's just maybe it's a personal thing, but not leaving room for me to respond or ask questions. I know that you've probably prepared something and you've got a bit of a script that you're going along, or maybe you're kind of working to a, a loose bullet points in your head, but yeah, I love to be able to jump in and ask questions and respond and, and even just kind of go, oh, we, 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 time's up, we've got to go. But sometimes people are just so in the moment and entrenched that they, they kind of forget that this is a conversation rather than just a one-way um, Sales thing. pitch, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Do, where do you find, I mean, do people pitch at you in all sorts of places? Or I, I mean, I asked you that because I think one of the worst things that ever happened to me when I was actually at ABC, I think, I was at the Sheffield Documentary Conference in the ladies' toilet 
doing, you know, what you do. And the next thing, under the door came a pitch. Can you believe it? A written pitch. What, on a piece of toilet paper or was it actually on, a, on an A4? <laughs> that's, A4. That's, that's extreme. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got anything quite that extreme, but... Yeah, you do. You do all sorts of times. I mean, my least favorite actually also is when people slide into my DMs on a social media platform, particularly Facebook, which I get it. That might be the only way that you can find me. But yeah, I particularly like it because it's always out of hours. It's always like 10 o'clock at night and you can you know that they've seen that you've seen the message. So you feel like you there's pressure to respond. Just email me. Please just email me rather than um, DMing me. Let's get that email address up there right now. Tell me your email address, Lee. The best one is online at screenaustralia.gov.au. We'll put it up as a little link that people can go to. So what, like when you think of, you talked about people sort of not shutting up um, during a pitch. What other things don't you like them doing? Um, I guess when you, you want people to be prepared and that's, that's actually my first tip as well is do your research slash be prepared. Like you, you want people to know their project when you kind of, if people can't answer your first question or the basic questions, like what format is this? What platform is this? If they haven't even thought that surface level about things, then that I find quite frustrating. Like it's okay to, you know, do this research before you come and talk to me. And then it depends on context. So sometimes people are like, hey, I just want a bit of a friendly chat and a bit of advice about this. And that's fine. Then 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 we understand it's very early stages. But if if you've framed it as, hey, I want to pitch you something and get an idea of how I go about getting money for it, then yeah, you should know. You should know your staff. Yeah. And I think that again that going back to particularly at SBS, because you know, we'd often get um, this used to drive me insane. I'd get people come in there and go, Hi, I've been to Channel 9, Channel 7, Channel 10, ABC. Um, none of them wanted it, but now we know at SBS that you're just going to love it. <laughs> you're at the bottom of our list, so let me tell you that straight away. <laughs> yeah. And then I go, let me tell you that it's not going to work for us, but it's lovely to see you goodbye. <laughs> that's, do you think that's nerves? I, I sometimes find people say things that they maybe wouldn't when the, the tension's heightened and they just feel so nervous that, yeah, maybe that um, filter between mind and mouth isn't as active. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I don't think I ever told anybody quite that bluntly to go away. <laughs> Although I, I always did go, look, it's probably not the best way to open your pitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Okay, so you've agreed to take a meeting and I gather, what's your process on taking meetings, Lee? Yeah, normally people will email or, or call or get in touch and obviously a little different now, it's, it's Zoom, but I mean, if people are in Melbourne, which is where I'm based, I, I, I'm happy to meet and go across the road to any number of cafes in South Melbourne where the Screen Oz office is. But, I'll, you know, we're Screen Australia, so people can call or we can do video calls or, or whatever works. And, and sometimes it comes through an email and you can kind of answer questions that way. So I'm pretty flexible. Often I think a conversation is just easier because you can just provide feedback or answer questions. And, and, you know, we're a government agency. We have a lot of processes. So often there's a lot of questions, not just around the creative, but how do I even go about applying? Is this a good time to apply? Do you still have money left this financial year? All relevant questions that you should ask in your pitch. Um, and we'll want to know the same things. How much money are you going to ask for? What, when are you planning on coming in with your application? Um, so, yeah, we tend to kind of have a conversation with people first, get on our radar, we can answer any questions and and maybe clear up any confusion because we're scripted narrative in my department, so we can't do documentary or factual or light entertainment, um, a lot of which Green Australia doesn't even do. We have a great documentary department, but we stay away from that light entertainment side of things. So even just sometimes you can answer questions really quickly and go, okay, that's probably not appropriate for, it's, you know, not eligible. And I remember you saying to me that you'll pretty much take meetings with anybody and uh, and request from everybody. I mean, what's your take on that? Is you just happy to talk? Yeah, I mean, I guess we're the playing in the emerging space with a lot of newer creators, and you know, I've been at Screen Oz for nearly two years now, and I very um, clearly remember what it was like being on the other side. Sometimes you need someone to tell you what that guidelines form on the website means or to decode, you know, that document or, or, or whatever it may be. So, yeah, I, I guess we're trying to add as much value as we can while being aware that we're a pretty small department. There's three of us. We've got a very small budget per financial year. So, unfortunately, not everything's going to get funded. But sometimes it can be helpful to, you know, meet with people like myself or my colleagues in online who, 
you know, we talk to people, not just producers, but we talk to a lot of platforms and commissioning broadcasters and people like that. So we can often feedback what they might be looking for as well. So, yeah, I mean, within reason, if you've got a project that you think is suitable for online production or online development funding, um, knowing as well that it's a very busy time as we get closer to the end of financial year. And obviously right now, people are very keen for funding. Um, there may be a bit of a delay, but yeah, happy to talk and to give a steer as, as long as we've, we've got the time. One of the things that we talked about in the run up to this is what makes a good pitch for you? Can you can you think of some examples, perhaps one that's led to a commission? Yeah. Um, I mean, the one that stands out to me, and I very clearly remember it, creating around a, a conference phone in the Sydney Screen Australia office, talking to the team at Ludo Studios up in Brisbane, hearing their pitch for content, which went on to be the first vertical series in Australia that was commissioned. So ABC were part of that. Um, was Arson Screen Queensland um, and Ludo basically pitched it as um, it's a, a vertical narrative series set on the mobile phone of a wannabe influencer. So you, you not only see what she's Googling, what she's texting and sending, but the kind of stuff that she's texting and deleting or that she's searching uh, that she doesn't want other people to see. Or, um, yeah, so you kind of get that extra layer of, of, um, of narrative in there and, and, and um, of excitement in the, in the scripts. And hearing the pitch and, and knowing that the team had been, you know, they were finding their way with it. And they're very clear that like, this is a, a quite an innovative series, but straight away I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't recall watching anything that's been purpose built for a, a mobile phone to be held vertically and to be only kind of consumed that way. So I was interested from, from that point onwards. And then, then when you dive into that series more and, and as it progresses and we, we read scripts and episode outlines, the writer of that show, Anna Barnes is particularly talented and it was quite exciting to read not only a great idea and a great concept, but something that was actually really well written and constructed. So yeah, but, but from that first pitch, it was like, okay, you've, you've got me. That log line is interesting. I want to know more. So a good log line in that case too. I mean, what, do you remember what the log line was? I think it was something like that, like a vertical series set inside the world of a wannabe influencer's phone. I'm, I, I'm sure it was better written than that, but it's, yeah, it's basically telling you that it's inside the phone. Someone wants to be, you know, YouTube famous, essentially, um, and, and how they get there. Um, and you're watching it all, yeah, inside their phone. It's, um, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, and I really like that because you're right, it's, it, it does what it says on the tin. What other part of the, did they bring other things with you with them for that? Did they have scripts or sizzle or proof of concept? They did have a proof of concept, yeah. It was quite different to the end product. There was a different character, a male, playing the lead role and ended up being two females in the lead. Um, and he was a lot more like that character was written a lot more egotistically and he was, he was a lot harder to connect with. So I think they made that and then realized they needed to kind of soften that character a bit and make them more relatable, but it definitely helped with seeing. So I think in the proof of concept, like he, he orders Uber eats while he's talking to somebody that, and I think they're both, basically they're both, they're both lying to each other and it ends up that the Uber Eats driver was a person he was texting with anyway. And I think he was trying to fire her from her job and she was trying to tell him that she had a new job. So it was a bit of like a reveal. It kind of played out more like a sketch, but definitely gave you a sense of, okay, here's how that works. You see him texting and then jumping from into another window to say something else and then go back to his Uber Eats order and see where his delivery driver is. So you kind of see it all play out. And, you know, I think it was in an article about, content in the, when it was released that someone was watching it and they got a call from their mum and they didn't realize it wasn't part of the show and so they <laughs> because you're seeing all the phone calls come up and how important is it um i mean ludos is a you know great company and how important is it the company's pedigree in terms of when they're pitching to you look it helps but it's also important to know that like as i said before we're, we're here for the emerging creators and we're here for people who might be sometimes playing with funding for the first time. So I guess what we're looking at is, do you have, do we think you've got the ability to pull this off? And something of that scale, like content, it's pretty high concept. It's, there's a lot of pieces to it. There's a lot of VFX and posts. So yeah, you'd need some a company with that pedigree if you're pitching that kind of show. But conversely, we're funding projects we announced on the other day, Power of the Dream, uh, an Olympics theme season, which will, now the Olympics are delayed, it will have a bit more time in pre-production. But that's a new team, um, Alexandra Keddy and her business partner, Gemma Bird Matheson. You know, they're a very small, newer company. And, and similarly, that, that project is quite small scale and they'll be able to achieve it. So we go, great. We think that you've got the ability to pull this off because it's, there's not too many moving pieces to it. I think it's all just relative. And 
do you recommend at times that people partner up if the project's an interesting one but that they don't have the skills? Yeah, that can help. I mean, we, we can't really be recommending or brokering those relationships. That needs to come from the producers and the teams. Um, but, yeah, that can help. Um, I guess it's then just about what are you, uh, what are you giving up in order to, to benefit from partnering with a bigger production company potentially. Um, and, again, that's another pitch, right? You've got a pitch to get that production company on board to get them invested in your project so they can then maybe go out and pitch it to funding bodies and, and commissioning platforms and stakeholders. One of the things that, you know, you often hear about in pitching workshops and things that the first impressions of a person are really, really important. Is that the case for you or do you dig deeper or how do you work on first impressions? Yeah, I guess because we can't fund until we get an application in that often pitch meetings for us are a bit more like just a relationship builder and getting a sense of that project. Um, but you know, I think, I think we all deal on first impressions, right? You can't not judge somebody from the first thing that you, that you see of them. But um, that said, I think creatives and producers and directors and writers come in all sorts of shapes and forms and walks of life. And um, yeah, you, you hope that, I guess if you're talking about first impressions of the project and what they pitch, yeah, that I think is really important when they, if they can articulate again, that, that elevator pitch really nicely summed up of what the show's about and then can go deeper into what it's really about and then maybe what it's really, really about. And here are some of the other ingredients. Mm -hmm. And if you can see that level of research and work into it, that I think creates a really strong first impression. Yeah. And I mean, and I think that's the point, isn't it? I always say to producers that if you can't tell me in one line, in the log line, as you describe it, what your project is in, I don't get it. So I'm not going to understand it. Why would I commission it? Is that fair in your mind? Yeah, I think, I, don't, I wouldn't say people just get the one chance to do it, but I think you've got to be able to sell something. That said, there are always, you know, different examples and, and things that um, don't, that, you know, break that mould where you, you might not be able to articulate that well, but when you see it, you know what it is and it's great. And that's when maybe a proof of concept might be really helpful to, to see something in action. But yeah, I think typically you're right. It, it's nice to be able to hear something in one line, one sentence, summed up, this is what it is, this is what you're going to see. And here's, here's what not only what you might relate to about it and know, but here's why it's different to anything else you've ever seen. So that's a lot to put into one line, but, you know, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that I look back to when I was at ABC was actually we commissioned a show called Choir of Hard Knocks, and yeah. it came into us the week before Christmas, a one-pager going, Jonathan Welsh wants to teach homeless people to sing. And... I went, oh, my God, I just so love that because I want to learn about homelessness, but I'm, I don't want to commission something about homelessness. But a choir gives me that sort of in. And it was like a Trojan horse moment. But for mm. me, it was like, unless, that, unless Jonathan can't, sit, can't speak or can't sing or can't teach choir, I want to show. Is that how you respond to projects at times as well? Oh, absolutely. There's nothing more exciting than walking away from a meeting and going, yeah, I can see that show and I'm excited for it. And that's such a good phrase, the Trojan horse, when people like, you know, they hide the vegetables in the, in the <laughs> sauce, so to speak, that the, you might be given something that looks like one thing, but really the deeper message underneath it is, um, is, is much bigger and, and more exciting. And that's what it's really about. Um, yeah. And I think SBS are pretty good at that at the with the on-demand stuff we've been doing with them, which is Homecoming Queens and Robbie Hood and that stuff where at much surface level, like Robbie Hood, for example, is a take on the Robin Hood story set um, in uh, Alice Springs with Robin, Robin Hood and his merry men played by a bunch of Indigenous teenagers. So I love that. It's one of my favourite online, I mean, favourite comedy things ever. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, I agree. I think it's so good and so, like, you know, on the surface, it's, you know, kind of the Robin Hood story that we know with a different spin on it, but obviously deeper themes about it. There's some beautiful scenery in Alice Springs and, and some really lovely comedy and, and half-up moments, not to mention the music, which, you know, the Robbie's dad plays guitar and sings a lot of the songs for it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great Trojan horse example to me. And how did that one come to you, Lee? That was that, how was that pitch? Do you remember? I think it was before my time. I think it got, it, that applied just when I started. So my colleague Elise assessed that, um, and, you know, gave some feedback on it, gave some notes, and that was taken on board. But, yeah, that was Ludo as well, actually. Not the best example because we're the same production company, but Ludo since 1788. Um, but a 
lot of that, it had been developed with SBS. So by the time it came to us, it was in pretty good shape, um, is my understanding. And a lot of your projects in that position where they've actually been broadcast, I mean, developed with a broadcaster, say like SBS or production company? No, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Like we, we do a lot more kind of self-releases at the moment. Um, there's not a huge uh, commissioning appetite in Australia or, or opportunities for short form content. Um, and then sometimes we play in like, I guess, lower budget TV shows like The Other Guy or Squinters with broadcasters or commissioning platforms. Um, but no, I mean, we do a pretty big range and I'm, I'm pretty proud of the, the range of stuff that we find from post-production projects that might be an investment from us of $30,000 all the way up to, you know, low budget TV, um, like the other guy that's, you know, uh, a couple of million dollars for the budget. So, and I think that's important that this should, we should cover that range and be giving people that first opportunity, but also be able to, to take people through on a talent escalation vehicle, like, you know, Matt O'Kine writing his first show and Casey Anning, and then in the second season, Gracie Otto directing their first TV series. So all those opportunities we see ourselves here to try and, and do. One of the um, other guests that we've had on Running Free is Michael Shanks. He's oh. coming up. We've done the interview with him. Tell me about Rebooted, because that's just a staggering piece of work. Was yeah. that one that you commissioned? Again, I can't take credit for that. <laughs> it happened in the, in the skip ahead round that was kind of in play just before I started. So Rosie Lord, who was in my chair before me, um, can, can take the credit for that. Uh, I agree. I think it's fantastic. And I'm so, so glad to see that it's doing really well. Um, so if you don't know Rebooted, it's basically the story of a, a, a stop motion skeleton movie star from a kind of monster movie heyday who now can't even get a gig as the lead role in the reboot of the film he was famous for. So he's basically an out of work actor, which is a, a kind of pitch we get a lot, but the spin on it is that he's a stop motion skeleton. So yeah, Shanks and, and the team pitched that and, and, you know, everyone's first question was how are you going to do this on an online budget? Because it is a tiny budget. And Shanks he told me it was minuscule. I don't think he had a day off in about three years. <laughs> no, they turned part of the office into their stop motion studio. But yeah, and we kept getting email updates from the producer saying, look, we're, we're a little behind schedule. And then the next one, look, we're a little bit more behind schedule. And I'm like, you know, that's okay. We can be flexible and knowing that the results were probably going to be uh, pretty great. And, and as we all hoped, they really are. Like it's such a great, I think it's 10, 12 minutes um, piece. Uh, yeah, that, that I think is, is some of the finer work we've done in the last couple of years online, and I can't take a lot of credit for it. I think Shanks and his team have, have knocked it out of the park. <laughs> okay, now, in the run-up to this, you gave me some great tips about pitching. So I'd like to just go through them one by one. Now, the first one, and we've touched on it briefly already, but do your research. What does that mean in practice, Lee? Yeah, I think I, I take it in two ways. First of all, do your research on the kind of person you're pitching to. Maybe it's better phrased like know who you're pitching to, not just the organization. So for example, Screen Australia operate in a very different way to a broadcaster, to a production company that you might be trying to get on board. Or if you're trying to pitch to, you know, a, a collaborator to come on board with a project for you. For example, as I said earlier, everything that we fund has to have an application. So I can't tell you in, in a pitch meeting, hey, yep, great, you've got the funding. But people often expect that I can. Um, yeah, we have to take things to decision meetings and assess them and, and write a paper on them for a government organisation. And you'll find that a lot of the state agencies are the same. We don't have rounds in my department. We just roll through all year round, but a lot of places have rounds. So are you pitching at the right time? That information is normally available on the website of those organisations. Pretty transparent. You can find when the deadlines are. And then the people as well, like know who you're specifically pitching to. Like, does this person, are you pitching a, a out and out comedy show to somebody who has never commissioned a piece of comedy in their life and has no interest in it? Um, are you, are you pitching something to the right kind of person? What's their, what's their background? What other jobs have they come from and what other projects have they commissioned? How does yours sit alongside this? Cause it's nothing worse than getting, you know, one line into a pitch and then being told, Oh yeah, we've, We've got that in development or we've actually just announced that project last week. Like sometimes you're never going to know if they've got a whole slate of unannounced projects, but if they have announced stuff or if it's gone on air, even worse, and you're pitching that same show to somebody. Um, Not a yeah. good look. Not exactly. a good look. But yeah. just do your research. It's all there and, and it does take time, but yeah, we put everything on our website. You subscribe to our newsletter. We've got podcasts about this stuff. If you're listening to this, you're already doing some good research. So yeah. And remind me of the website address, address again. Let's have yeah. it screenaustralia.gov.au slash online is where our online production guidelines are and there's links there to all of our initiatives and development funding um, so yeah 
the Screen Oz website's got a lot of good resources on it. Okay. The other thing you talk about is backing yourself in a pitch. We've said, oh, my God, it's so scary. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think and you've probably been here as well, Denise. When people start that pitch with, oh, I'm terrible at pitching, but I'll just, I'll give it a go. I'm like, well, straight away, you've lost me. Like, if you're, if you believe you're terrible at pitching, how am I going to believe that you're, you're anything but? So I think you've got to have a bit of just, just confidence and bravado about it. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, a fine line to tread there. Don't be too arrogant about it. But I think, you know, even if you believe you're terrible at pitching, then, well, then practice and, and get better at it. Or is there someone else in your team who's better at it that should be doing it? The reality is it's a big part of the industry. Everyone is taking pictures, either picture videos or pictures at, over coffee at Screen Forever and, or, or, you know, over the phone or over Zoom meetings nowadays. So either get better at it or find someone on your team who is. But don't tell me that you're bad at it. Just believe in yourself and, and know that, well, if you created this project, if it's something you believe in, then you should be able to articulate that. Even if you um, get your camera out and practice to yourself, that you know, there's lots and lots of ways. And and talk to your flatmate or your mum or whoever. Yeah, that's that's my fourth tip. So we'll skip three and come back to it in a sec. But yeah, rehearse, rehearse your pitch. Like practice it to people who are in the industry. Practice it to people who aren't. And practice it to your mirror. Camera is a great one because then you can watch it back and and see. And you know, you want to be flexible and be able to improvise in the moment and make it a dialogue. But yeah, you should know that those words you're saying, you shouldn't be saying them for the first time. And I did like also that you suggested in that tip that you sent me, get feedback from people not in the entertainment industry as well. Yeah, because can you articulate this to a person on the street um, or someone who's you know never, never worked in entertainment before and, and will they get it? And that's important because we need to be able to see that this, we all speak the same language in the industry, but it's got to be able to speak to the audience. Perfect. Okay, next one, out of order, but number three, um, structure your pitch. Tell me more. Yeah, so you're always going to have a, a kind of set time for how long you're going to pitch for, right? And I feel like you should devote the same percentages and be able to kind of grow or shrink that pitch as appropriate. You might be having, you know, you might get like five minutes in a corridor with somebody at a conference to pitch them your idea. You might be sitting across from them having a coffee and have an hour to do it. Um, but you should still cover the same elements and you should devote the same ratio of time to them. There's not a hard and fast list, but you should definitely be talking about, you know, plot and then the deeper themes, uh, the genre of the show, comp titles, so things that are similar to it, but how is it also different enough to them? Um, a tangent to that, please stay away from um, Fleabag and um, Sex Education is the other one at the moment we're getting a lot of. We just get that on every single pitch and I get that they're great, but how is it different to them? Like, it's got to be different because they've, they've been done. So give us some point of difference. Oh, my God. That is, that, <laughs> that is a, a failing of all producers, I think. They see something that's really successful. I bet there's a million squillion Tiger King pitches in yeah. every commissioner's basket at the moment. And people don't get that, actually. That's the last thing you want. You want some fresh ideas, the, the next wave, isn't it? Yeah. Or can you distill what was successful about that show? And can you draw a parallel in your production to it? These things that were successful about this, we've got them, but articulated and shown in this way. Like that's kind of what you, you're going to be doing because you, you want to be able to relate it to people, but also show that it's different and unique and original. Um, definitely format as well. Like tell us what the format is. In online, we can we find anything from, you know, a two episode series to a 30 episode series with episodes ranging from 90 seconds to half an hour or longer. So that's vital information. And, and I mean, if you don't tell us, we'll ask. So, you know, know that you tell us that you know the online landscape and how different things can be. Um, as well, alongside that, like, don't be afraid to give away the ending. I, another thing that I dislike is when people hold back an ending. Oh, you'll have to commission it to find out. Like, <laughs> In your me. dreams, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know the plot. If that ending is that good, then tell me and sell me on the show um, by giving me your great twist ending. Um, you know, I will, I'll be watching it, but I'll get a sense of what the ending is when I'm reading the scripts and watching the rough cuts and the fine cuts and the, the final cut and at the premiere. What sort of deliverables do you like as part of a pitch? What do you like them to leave behind with you? Me personally? Nothing. Hmm. I don't want um, printed out documents. I, I personally hate them and that this is just very particular to me, but yeah, I would much rather you email me a link through to your Bible or, or if there's a video or proof of concept, but I don't want a physical object 
especially if I'm at a conference and I've got to then carry that around with me. Um, yeah, I'm just, or, or even worse, scripts. I, I can't read scripts on spec. You need to apply with the script. So don't, don't give me a script. Do you, did you ever like to be left stuff? I guess when you're in a broadcast position, you probably want something. Right? Oh, look, I hated it when they left too much behind. Actually, all I wanted was a one pager. And I actually learned that because, uh, the hard way because I also got a series out called The Problem with Men with John Clark. And I remember I wrote something like an 80 page pitch document and took that to the ABC. And they sort of looked at me as, as if I'd sort of lost my marbles. <laughs> You don't do that. I just wanted to make sure I covered every base and that every question that ever that never thought of was there. It was insane. One or two pages tops. And you're quite right. I don't need it printed out, basically. Yeah. yeah. Because you're also dealing with people who are getting a lot of other pictures. So they don't have time to read everything or to go through it. I have to prioritise assessments that have been submitted. I can't read a script that hasn't applied and ignore someone who's gone to the trouble of filling out an application. So... Yeah, that again goes along with do your research and know what kind of things people people might respond to or that they're going to need. So I guess the final stage in this is a sort of follow-up. Um, I know that at Screen Australia you'll have certain processes, but what do you want or expect or even not want from producers that have pitched to you? Following up and following through is a really good step for people. A lot of producers will pitch something and say, great, I'm going to... I'm going to bring that in with an application next week. And then you, you know, you don't see it again for another six months. Um, you know, by the same token, we know that, you know, life doesn't always go to plan and things take longer than people expect. But yeah, I think just doing what you say you're going to do and, and, you know, following up on that. Um, yeah. And, and then knowing also that we can't do anything until you apply. Like we can't give you that creative feedback or that, that yes or no until you've actually put an application in and, and waited your, uh, in normal time, six to eight weeks for us to assess. How much hassle is too much hassle for you, Lee? Um, I think about once a week if you haven't heard back. Like I got an email yesterday from somebody and then another email today following up. I'm like, uh, I, it's busy times. You've got to give me more time to get back to you. But yeah, I think a week is probably pretty fair. I think I could learn a bit about that myself. I'm <laughs> a bit of a hassle queen. <laughs> yeah, hey, let's... You've got, to, you've, you've got to make noise as well. You've got to stand out. So, you know, you do you and let people tell you when you're hustling too much. I love it. Okay. So, and I guess sort of to wrap up, the one piece of advice that I also really liked from you, and it's something you referred to earlier, this is not make or break. So what are you saying to people when you say that? Keep trying. Keep, keep going. And there's all those examples of, you know, I'm sure I get this wrong, but the Beatles were rejected however many times before they got an album deal or whatever it is, or Walt Disney, or those those classic examples. Like, you don't get just one opportunity uh, unless you give up after that first decline or that first refusal. So keep going. This is, and I guess the other part of it is this: this is important. So put the work into the pitch, but don't let this overtake your life. Don't be so nervous that you can't even speak. Just be yourself. Do your best, and then know that you know you might be doing another pitch tomorrow or it might be another year before you do one but you will get other chances to pitch that project perfect and on that note i'm going to say tell me your email address again and then say thank you. i'll be saying thank you for being here lee <laughs> Look, the best one is is online at screenaustralia.gov.au and that will get through to our online inbox and we, we i think we have to respond to those um obviously you know put something nice in there too <laughs> A little, yes, absolutely. Okay, and on that note, um, I'm going to say thank you to Lee and uh, see you next time. Great. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for having me. And in the meantime, if you want to contact me, it's Denise at, at mediamentors.com.au. I want to say a mega thank you, of course, to Lee, but also to Acme, who have been absolutely amazing partners in this they record it they edit it they put it out they're amazing we love them to bits then we'll see you next time on running free skills take care bye bye lee bye. <laughs>